Okay, let's get started. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Perry. I'm the Secretary of the Public Protection Cabinet and also co-chair of the Team Kentucky Medical Cannabis Advisory Committee. Uh, my other colleague and co-chair, Secretary Kerry Harvey, could not be here tonight. Unfortunately, he's uh, recovering from COVID. Um, he really wanted to be here for this event and also to address some other things uh, that's recently some tragedy that's happened in this area. So in his place, uh, his chief of staff, Mona Walnack, is, is right here and she will be joining us tonight representing the Justice Cabinet. I'd like to thank everyone here to, uh, for making the effort to get here. Uh, it's, it's, it's an important meeting. Um, we want to hear your stories, uh, answer your questions, participate in open discussion about the benefits uh, concern and concerns around medical cannabis. The governor and his entire committee, this entire committee appreciates everybody being here and being part of the discussion. We also have a very important guest tonight, Representative Angie Hatton. Um, she is a strong advocate for medical cannabis. Last legislative session, she sponsored uh, House Bill 136, an act relating to medical cannabis, a bill that received bipartisan support. So Representative Hatton, would you like to say a few words, please? Hello, everybody. I'm State Representative for Letcher County, part of Pike County, and part of Harlan County. I've been serving for six years now. Um, and I co-sponsored House Bill 136, um, which is the medicinal cannabis um, legislation. I think I have co-sponsored it every year that I've served in the legislature. And when I got there six years ago, it was pretty controversial still. Um, but I had heard from so many of my constituents that this was something that they needed um, and that would help them live better lives or in some cases live. Um, and six years later, it's not even controversial. 90% of Kentuckians are in favor of legalizing medicinal cannabis. Um, 38 states and the District of Columbia have passed some form of legalization. Um, it is um, a substance that's been around for 5,000 years and as far as I know has never killed anybody, but it could take the place of some very harmful drugs. When properly regulated, when properly prescribed by a physician, it can be um, the gateway to a better quality of life for an awful lot of my constituents. And I get calls and messages and emails constantly about this issue. Um, and I know that over 1,600 emails have already been received by the commission. You can also submit your comments online. Um, and I, I hope that some more folks show up in person, but if not, this will be on YouTube. Comments will still be submitted online because I know it's a huge issue for my constituents because I hear from them. Um, one of the main reasons that I, I got interested in the issue and, and taught myself more about it in the first place was a man named Eric Crawford, who um, lives in um, Mason County, and um, he, or Fleming County. Masonville in Fleming County. Maysville in Fleming County. Okay. Anyway, he comes to see me all the time in Frankfurt because he and his wife lobby for legalization of medicinal, medicinal cannabis. And Mr. Crawford was in a terrible car accident um, and lost the use of his legs. He's in a wheelchair. And he comes to Frankfurt with a, it looks like a Ziploc bag, but it's enormous. Um, it, it barely fits in his lap and it's full of prescription medications. And all of those have side effects and they interact with one another and some of them are addictive. And he could replace every one of them for his issues if he were able to have medicinal cannabis. And I could tell you stories the rest of the, the evening about people who've contacted me for PTSD, for all these various issues, but that's not what this is for. This is for you guys to be able to ask questions or relate your own stories. I'm really glad you're here. I think it's an issue whose time has come. We're one of the last 12 states to hold out um, and not be able to provide this sort of health care for our constituents. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that the governor 
appointed this advisory council um, and that I know they're going to travel the state and hear from people all over the state of Kentucky about um, all of the concerns around medicinal cannabis. Um, I'm also pleased that my brother is uh, one of the, the people who was appointed to the commission, Dr. Jonathan Hatton, who practices over in Letcher County. And I think that one of the main reasons that we need medicinal cannabis is um, people consider it a gateway drug, but what it can really be is an off-ramp from never getting addicted to opioids in the first place or replacing op addictive medications with safe, not physically addictive treatment. So thank you all very much for being here and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Representative. I'd also like to thank the University of Pikeville for their partnership in allowing us to use this state of the art health professions and education building. It is a wonderful facility. I mean, the view here, you can't beat that. Um, so the idea of Collaborative learning is a great fit for our work here tonight. I will now turn it over to Mona Walmack for introductions of our advisory committee who are both um, in person and virtual. The committee members are ready to engage, answer questions and provide information. They're a solid group of experts and I encourage, I encourage audience dialogue with them this evening. So Mona. Thank you. Hello. On behalf of the governor, Secretary Harvey, and the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet, I want to take a moment to recognize the loss that Eastern Kentucky has faced with the tragic deaths of three law enforcement officers and their canine. Please know that the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet and this administration is committed to the safety of our law enforcement officers who stand on the front lines daily to protect serve and create a better, safer Kentucky. We are praying for the fallen peace officers, families, loved ones, and the Floyd County community. Next, I'd like to thank and recognize each of our committee members for serving our Commonwealth by listening to Kentuckians and advising the governor on access to medical cannabis for Kentuckians suffering from chronic pain and other medical conditions. Each of you, bring a unique perspective to this committee with your relevant experience in healthcare, treatment of addiction, law enforcement, criminal justice, and advocacy for medical cannabis. Thank you for dedicating your time and expertise to this committee. And we look forward to hearing and learning from your perspectives. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce um, the Team Kentucky Medical Cannabis Advisory Committee members. And if you're here, when I call your name, if you don't mind to stand, some people are attending virtually. Dr. Amber Can of LaGrange, pharmacy coach and adjunct professor at Spalding University. Julie Cantwell of Rineyville, advocate with Kentuckians for Medical Marijuana. Jennifer Cave of Louisville, member at Stites and Harbison. Eric Crawford of Maysville, advocate. Cookie Cruz of Frankfurt, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Dr. John Farmer of Louisville, OBGYN, Medical Director of Solid Ground Counseling and Recovery Addiction Treatment Provider in Louisville, Moorhead and Hazard. Dr. Jonathan Hatton of Whitesburg Family Medicine, Mountain Comprehensive Health. Brian Joyter of Jeffersonville, Indiana, Certified Public Health Worker in Louisville. Dr. Nick Coons of Lexington, Internal Medicine at Clark Regional Medical Center. Alex Crate of Cincinnati, Ohio, Director of the Chase Center on Addiction Law and Policy at Northern Kentucky University. Dr. Linda McLean of Louisville, OBGYN at Commonwealth Counseling Center. Andrew Sparks of Lexington, former Assistant U.S. Attorney. Dee Dee Taylor of Louisville, Chief Executive Officer at 502 Hemp Wellness Center. Julie Wallace of Morganfield, who is the Union County Attorney. And Kristen Wilcox of Beaver Dam, co-founder of Kentucky Moms for Medical Cannabis. Thank you, Mama. So as you can see, we have a great group here representing law enforcement, legal, health profession, advocacy, addiction, recovery, you know, so this is, this is a, a really good uh, group of people. 
First off, I'd like to go over a few ground rules before we get started. In a few mo uh, minutes, I will open up the, fl the floor to discussion, but just a couple of notes about what tonight is not. This is not about recreational marijuana use. It's about exploring safe and effective ways to alleviate the suffering of a lot of our fellow Kentuckians. A lot of times as part of this, the discussion, recreational use comes up, but I just wanna say clearly, these are separate issues. And I know people are compassionate about both, but this is what we're talking about here, rec uh, medical cannabis. So we know that two issues should be dealt with separately because that's what so many of our sister states have done successfully. So this will not be a debate or discussion on recreational use. This is not a partisan political issue. If we look at public polling in Kentucky, medical cannabis enjoys widespread, widespread support from Republicans, Democrats, and independents. If we look at what other states have done, 38 states have authorized the use of medical cannabis, including states controlled by both Democrats and Republicans. If we look at our own legislative body here in Kentucky, the House of Representatives took a vote on a measure that would have authorized medical cannabis that had overwhelming support by both Republicans and Democrats. So thankfully, this is not about partisan politics. Quite simply, this is about finding information that will assist our governor in making decisions that might lead to the alleviation of a lot of pain and suffering on part of our fellow citizens. So that's a pretty important endeavor. Just a couple of ground rules for our conversation tonight. The committee is here to engage with you on this important topic. Feel free to share your stories, experiences, and ask questions of our experts. Each speaker will have five minutes and we will monitor the time. Please be respectful of everyone and honor this time limit. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on medicalcannabis.ky.gov. We're also taking notes. All the comments from tonight's meeting will be shared to the governor. We'll first call up speakers who registered their comments on our website and then we can hear from everyone else in the room as time allows. And I'll ask that you please state your name, the county you're from before you start with your comments. And I just also wanna note that I have, um, we on our website, as of this morning, we have received 1,668 responses, 1,645 are in support, 23 opposed, it's 98.62% in favor of medical cannabis. If our registered speakers would come to the mic and uh, they can go first and then people can line up behind them if anybody that didn't register wants to speak. And our first is Jennifer and Rick McClanahan. Are they here? Read, read them all. Melissa Isom, Maxwell Collins, Kelly Hopkins, Jeremy Holbrook, Leah King, Elijah Rosenbaum, and Janice Brewer. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Maxwell Collins. I'm 26 years old, born and raised in Wattsburg, Kentucky, Ledger County. It's my hometown. I love it. Um, I have a wife and son, another son on the way. So I'm a family man. Um, I do what I can to support them and survive in these tough times, but it makes it a lot harder when I can't have this job or that job because I choose to use cannabis to treat my condition. Um, that's why I'm here today. And I'm so thankful to hear and speak to, hear and speak to some like-minded people, you know, on this subject. Uh, I suffer from chronic pancreatitis and man, it sucks. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 21, not long after my 21st birthday. You know, I started to drink here and there, but nothing unusual. And I ended up in the hospital really quickly with acute pancreatitis, and they couldn't believe it at my age, you know. But after many, like, long trips and many trips to the ER, I found out I had a deficiency, which caused, you know, 
in combination with the drinking caused my pancreatitis. So it became chronic soon after. And, uh, you know, it's been really hard because even some doctors, a, a GI in Hazard even kind of like put me down for it. And it's like, you know, it kind of hurt. It was really embarrassing because I know what cannabis does for me. It takes away that cr that chronic constant burning pain. You know, it's not good for acute pain, but it's great for chronic pain and, you know, can truly help us you know, and many people that I know who may not be here today, but I can be their voice. So I'm proud to be there um, and be here. But I never lost hope that, you know, someday people like him would see how much this plant could help me and others like me, you know, thanks to new studies and research, things are beginning to change. And I'd just like to thank you all, first of all, and Governor Bashir for uh, seeing and believing us. Um, we can use this plant responsibly. There's no more time for us to be treated like children and told that we can't, you know, you know, recreational is a complete different issue. This is about medical, like you said, you know, people need help, I need help. And I don't wanna leave my home state just to get that help. I would love to stay in Kentucky and be at the forefront of whatever this may become. So just thank you all for the opportunity. Um, you know, thanks for listening to my story, but I believe without hope there's, I believe without hope there is no faith, you know, so we have to have hope and faith with this. And hopefully I pray that Governor Bashir can take this executive action help us all. So God bless y'all and thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Would anybody from the panel like to speak on what he just said? Yeah. Would anybody like I, to comment? I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um, so what Mr. Collins was speaking on was a condition called chronic pancreatitis. Is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me? So what uh, Mr. Collins was speaking on was a condition called chronic pancreatitis. It's characterized by chronic abdominal pain worsened by eating, uh, in particular, certain foods. Um, it's a gnawing uh, and very uncomfortable kind of pain associated with nausea, vomiting, GI upset, that kind of stuff. It's a very um, despairing kind of condition to have. Uh, there's no real markers that we can see on CT scan. The enzymes aren't typically elevated like we see in acute pancreatitis. And a lot of times those patients will get labeled as drug seeking because it is a very painful uh, and a very uncomfortable condition. And it's one that doesn't have a real, yep, obviously this is this makes the diagnosis. So it's, it's a disparaging kind of thing to have. Um, some of the symptoms that he mentioned, uh, there's some good data from medical cannabis uh, in support of the efficacy of treatment of chronic pain, as he said. Not good data for acute pain, but good data for um, chronic pain. Um, also, there's some evidence supporting its use for nausea, vomiting, uh, and also appetite. Those things can be uh, can be associated with chronic pancreatitis. It can even be a wasting illness, um, you know, in its severe forms. And medical cannabis has been shown, while not specifically for chronic pancreatitis, some of the symptoms uh, and signs associated with chronic pancreatitis. So I think it could be a tool certainly to treat those symptoms. Um, and if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to take those. Hello. I just want to say thank you for sharing your story uh, beyond the medical aspect of it. Um, there's people all over this state that have similar stories and and there's been a long um, history of propaganda driven misinformation um, and I think that we have to end that taboo and the best way to do so is to tell your story talk to people and um, and let's just get it out in the open and um, and that's how we can start these conversations because there's there are people everywhere just as desperate um waiting all over the state for for this change and so i just wanted to say that i appreciate you sharing just to add to what dr hyten said we already have cannabis products on the market by prescription that are used for nausea and vomiting in cancer patients. These are products that have been uh, dispensed by pharmacists for as long as I've been a pharmacist, which is longer than 20 years. So there's a long history of evidence 
for use of cannabinoids and products that are like cannabis um, that, uh, that we use to treat in conditions much like yours. Thank you for sharing your story. Who else on the list? Would you, yes, go right ahead. Hi, hello, thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Leah King, I'm from Wolf County. Um, I drove a long way to get here, so I'm glad I was able to find it. It's my first time here. Um, I moved here two years ago to Kentucky from Florida, which already has um, it in place. Been there for a few years now. Um, you go to your doctor, he determines whether or not you are a candidate for it. And if you are, he prescribes you a certain amount per month when it comes to the flour and the oils. Um, they have edibles now, I heard, but they didn't have it when I was still there. Um, so it's not just a free-for-all. I'm sure you guys have all the statistics and you're well aware of how all the other states work, but as somebody who actually got to do it, coming here, um, it was a drastic change for me. I'm diagnosed with PTSD, um, as well as a chronic back pain that I refuse to have surgery for because I'm scared it's gonna make it worse and they're just gonna throw opioids at me. Um, I've been off of opioids since 2009 when I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter. I, was, I had been on them consistently for about two years at that point. And what started was when I was 15, I got my um, tonsils and my adenoids removed and they prescribed me liquid hydrocodone. And I was immediately hooked after that. Uh, so I was very thankful that my daughter saved my life and I was able to get off the opioids. However, I did it with the use of cannabis. I know that um, smoking while pregnant is not good for you, but the horror that I went through trying to withdraw from the pills on top of being pregnant was just more than I could take. And so I made sure to tell my doctor what I was doing. And while she was against it, obviously, because it was 2009 and wasn't even in the works at that time, it was the only thing that helped me. Um, once I was able to get it legally and you walk into a dispensary, you have a certified person there that says, how are you today? How can I help you? What are you looking for? What's your problem? It is, it's like going to Target almost. You get the most wonderful experience from somebody who actually cares about you and what you're going through. And, and when we are buying it on the streets, you don't get that choice. It's whatever the person has available is what you get. Sometimes it's the kind that makes you super sleepy. Sometimes it's the kind that, you know, gives you some energy when you're not looking for that energy. You wanna go to sleep because those of us with PTSD can't sleep very well. I'm currently on four different medications just to help me sleep, to keep me asleep, to help me with my nightmares, and mood stabilization that comes the next day because I can't sleep. Um, nothing, I can't take anything during the day. No matter what we've tried, I'm either too tired. Um, I, I won't take benzos because I had an issue with those as well. She wanted to give me the Xanax and the Valium and the, um, what's that other one, Klonopin. And I said, no, please, no, 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 no. I can't do that because I remember those days. And so uh, we're working on it right now, but, I feel that if we had it here, the people like me, you know, I'm not in pain a lot. I'm not in excruciating pain, but my brain hurts all the time. And being on medical cannabis was really probably the, the best time in, since I was about 10 years old is when I really started with the, the moodiness, I guess you could say, from the trauma that I had, I had already been through up to that point, not to mention what had happened afterwards. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad to hear that the state is finally looking into it. When people ask me what it's like to be, live here, I'm like, it's like being in the early 2000s. We're trying. Kentucky is really trying. There's internet and there's online stuff. But now where I'm at, there's, you can't get on the website and find their opening hours of operation. You have to call them between nine and four. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it was, a, it was a quite a change. But everybody has been so wonderful since I've been here in Kentucky. It's, it's a little secret in the United States that I don't think a lot of people know about. And I'm so glad that you guys, as helpful as you've been to everyone for everything else, something as small as going to get baby clothes for my local church for my one-year-old baby is just amazing. I'm, I'm just so glad that the governor is wanting to do this and that you guys are here supporting this and that these people showed up 
hopefully to support this. I know it's supposed to be either or, but I have a feeling that the majority, based on the numbers you give me, the majority here is for it. So thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much for that. That's very good. Does anybody have any comments for her? Yeah. I was just going to ask, sweetie, have you tried um, like CBD and hemp products? Has that given you any kind of relief? Okay. Right. <laughs> you don't have to smoke it. I forgot to mention that part. So there's so many ways that you don't have to smoke it. True. And True. that would be helpful for the people who can't smoke it. Okay. I was just curious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to learn it. Is there anybody else on the, the that I registered? I called out the name. Eric, somebody's coming up here. <laughs> give you time. No hurry. <laughs> um, thank you all for having me here today. My name's Elijah Rosenbaum. I'm originally from Nelson County. Uh, I actually have four years of experience now, both a couple of years at a medical cannabis dispensary in Illinois, as well as a couple of years of licensed cultivation in California. And the issue that I would really like to put forward about medical cannabis in particular is preserving home grow, access, price, quality, putting it in the hands of medical patients so that they don't have to pay an exorbitant price to an insurance company or a pharmaceutical company. Quality, because nobody's going to protect their quality better than they themselves. And access, because that's the first thing you can do before waiting three or four years to let a major MSO or a major corporation come in and then provide for Kentucky, let Kentuckians grow Kentucky cannabis for Kentuckians. And that's about it. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. I can assure you that we'll get to the governor. He will hear what you said. Absolutely. I just want to say that since I signed up for this board and since I've been an advocate, we've had this conversation a lot. And I think that we need more people to voice this to their legislators. Um, Kentucky patients with a, um, this bill, the bill that, the bills that we have worked with the last several years have a list of qualifying conditions and most of which are debilitating and keep people, people have fixed incomes, they're not able to work. Um, and so I think that um, Kentucky patients absolutely want the ability to be able to grow their medicine at home. I don't think that um, just like going to the pharmacy, people should, people should be able to um, feed their family and have their medicine too. I see this is no different than um, any other medicine that we would get from the pharmacy. And, and when we have the ability to do it at home, I, I think that we absolutely should. So I encourage everybody um, to reach out to your legislators, when, especially when we have new bills to look at um, and voice your opinion of the importance. Thank you for, thank you for speaking up. <laughs> Okay, anybody else like to speak to the group? Yes, please. Just state your name and the county you're from. Hello, my name is Bobby Hamilton and I'm from Floyd County. Uh, 23rd of next month will be 22 years since I was rear-ended in an auto accident. And I've been on every kind of pain pill you can imagine up to and including uh, Oxycontin. And I was taken off that in 2010 because they told me they were restricting it to terminally ill patients only at the time. I, in June of 2010, I had an implanted morphine pump. It was implanted in my back. It's, it's feeding liquid morphine straight into my spinal canal 24 hours a day. Uh, that never stopped the pain. They started me at one milligram and I, Continually, continuously increased. In 2017, I had to have a second surgery because those batteries and those pumps 
last seven years. That's it. So I am currently in, in March of 2017. I have my second one put in. Uh, at that point, they tried to switch me from morphine to Dilaudid. I started having symptoms like one hand would swell up three times the size of the other one. One side of my face would swell up, maybe a leg, a testicle, an arm. I mean, I have pictures and it looks like a giant's hand next to a person's hand. Uh, currently, it took them six months to find out that the Dilaudid was what was causing my problem. So they had to switch me back to morphine. In October of 2019, uh, I have, well, let me explain. I have 10 discs messed up from the car accident. I have two in my neck, five in my mid back, and three in my low back that are damaged. In October 2019, I started having sharp pains and burning down my left leg. It's continuously increased, and they've increased my morphine. I originally started off at half a milligram of day. I'm currently at two and a half milligrams a day, and they don't want to increase it no more. So a year and a half ago, they started mixing bupivacaine in with my morphine. That's the same medication they use at the dentist's office when they're going to pull somebody's teeth or to give an epidural to a woman that's going to have a baby. Absolutely no help at all. And I was up to two and a half milligram of morphine, two and a half milligram of bupivacaine every 24 hours. This pump continuously flows. Uh, three months ago, I told them that, you know, at the rate of increase me, I told them it's not helping. So two months ago, they took half of the bupivacaine. They cut it in half. Last week, they took all the bupivacaine out. So I'm in a area right now that my doctors want to try new medications to see if they can help me deal with this nerve pain because I average about 20 hours a day in bed because getting up, walking around, sitting in these chairs is extremely painful. My pain scale generally is about an eight to a nine. They always ask me, why do you never get to a 10 on this pain? I had a five millimeter kidney stone in 2016. That's a 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a dead kidney from that, kill that uh, stone. It blocked the duct off to my kidney on the right side and it atrophied and died. <laughs> So I'm currently living on one kidney, taking two and a half milligram of morphine every day. And they're still, I'm on amitriptyline to try to help with just wearing clothes because my skin is so sensitive. It feels like an anaconda wrapped around my leg, having anything, even a blanket on me. And the lady said she has problems sleeping. The only way I sleep is four Xanaflex, four milligram pills about an hour before bedtime. That's the only way I sleep. Otherwise, I'm continuously moving up, down all night long. And I really appreciate you. And I'm hoping this gets legalized so maybe my doctor will let me try it so I can get through today. I really appreciate y'all listening to me. Thank you so much. Please. Um, was it Hamilton? Was it Mr. Hamilton? Thanks for sharing that with us, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Wow. His case seems um, severe and, and really chronic. It's not terribly uncommon. I'm family and addiction, uh, so I, I treat it from both sides. And we see stuff like this often. And you could hear the emotion in the gentleman's voice when he was speaking. And you, know, you can't manufacture that sort of thing. That's obvious. I'm not sure if it comes through on the internet, but you can, you can definitely uh, get a sense of it when you're sitting here with them. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that, that we deal with every day as a physician, particularly here in Eastern Kentucky. Um, as a physician, when someone comes in with a story like this, you almost kind of dread it in a sense, not because you're not sympathetic, but because we don't have great tools to help alleviate suffering. Most folks, when they get into healthcare, they want to help people. They want to alleviate suffering. And it makes us feel a little helpless um, when you see a gentleman that's clearly suffered the way he has. And you're supposed to be, uh, your job is supposed to be to help him with it. And you just don't have the tools. You could hear the kind of experimentation, it sounded like, and not really experimentation, but they're just trying different things to get them some relief. You know, they're doing their best. Um, it's just that they're limited in their tools as well. We, um, 
we face challenges like this all the time, you know, and, and the opioid epidemic has, has even made it more complicated because now we've learned kind of the error of over prescribing opiates, opiates, kind of the longer you take them, the less effective they are. It, it creates this conundrum. Um, a couple of the conditions you were talking about, there is some good um, data on the efficacy of uh, medical cannabis, in particular, the neuropathic pain. That's that pain he's talking about in his leg, the anaconda type pain he's talking about. There's some good evidence on that. Um, there's some good evidence that it can be uh, helpful in chronic pain as well as an adjunct to opiates. For some in severe case like him, you could have opiates and medical cannabis in conjunction to help with some synergistic effects and relieving uh, some of his pain. Um, but I think one of the problems is the lack of data and the lack of research that we've been able to do because it's, uh, it's scheduling. And as a physician, we try to practice evidence-based medicine and we lack evidence because we don't have proper studies. You know, if you look at any other condition, any other medication, there's just studies. You can Google them and there's a million pop up and you just take your choice. But uh, there's not as much data as you'd expect um, when you look at medical cannabis. So during the research that I've been doing lately, uh, 18 trials uh, in a PubMed, um, 15 of those 18 showed at least moderate efficacy for um, relieving of chronic pain, uh, neuropathic pain in particular, spasticity, uh, those sort of things have good evidence. PTSD is another one. Um, and when you think about an intervention as a physician does the benefit outweigh the risk and so is this medication safe and is it effective and when you look at those things it appears that a lot of these conditions that we're hearing um, complained about tonight certainly um, medical cannabis would check both of those boxes so it's something i think we need to strongly consider i think we got to treat it as a medication um, and it needs to be prescribed and taken responsibly you know, it's not the golden ticket. It doesn't cure all problems, but it is another tool to relieve suffering. And it appears to be a safe and effective tool when prescribed responsibly by someone with the, with the knowledge and experience. Anybody else? You there? Hello. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I just want to say that um, I, I talk to patients every single day. And I think that, you know, we can look at studies, but are we really listening to patients? Because there are so many patients that can give you, that can tell you exactly what this is doing for them. And like I said, I've talked to them every single day. And I know that people are, are getting relief from a lot of conditions with medical cannabis. So I think that we need to listen to patients as well. That's just what I want to say. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, this- We is also can't forget like um, what Rep Hatton said, this has been around for documented use has been around for over 5,000 years. Um, I think that it's, um, Contrary to what the doctor said, I, I believe that it's been studied more than any other um, medication or plant for over these years. We have, you know, 5,000 years plus of documented use and zero deaths to account for it. Um, and I think that um, I think that speaks for itself. I know that the United States has funded um, overseas um, studies for years and years. And I feel that the pharmaceutical industry has greatly blocked a lot of that, um, those studies. Um, but they're out there if you want to find them. Um, yes, we, I, we even have a patent for, um, which DD can tell you more about that, but we, the United States government has a patent. Um, and so, Yes, the, the information is out there. We know that it works. 37 states have done this. And um, it's just time we, we get on the road with it. I, I feel that um, a lot of the holdup is people want to rip it apart and try to find ways to individually profit off of it, different industries. And, um, and, and this is one of the areas like 
Ms. Cantwell said, we have to, it's time to listen to the patients. We can look at the information and dissect it all day long, but the bottom line is this is helping people and um, people are people are sick and tired of waiting. So it's time to do this. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm not looking to be pain free. I know this is not a situation that's ever gonna happen on me. I, I realize that. But I would like to be able to function and do something. Um, I don't know if you've ever been sick enough that you're in the bed for three, four, five days, 18, 20 every day, but try doing it seven days a week, four weeks a month for years now. It's, it's hard to function. Any relief at all would be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. One more thing to add about sure. Go ahead. Um, as far as safety goes, uh, in the the research, uh, there was like I said, eighteen uh, random studies. Uh, there were no major adverse uh, events reported. The minor events were pretty common, but there were no major events. Minor events were kind of similar to what you see when you look at the the package insert to most medications: dry mouth, sedation, nausea, things like that. But um, Pretty decent sized studies, 18 of them, no serious events occurred uh, during any of those. So pretty safe. So we know that it's safe with some minor exceptions, which aren't severe at all. And I'm sure not everybody might have any of those side effects. But in, and I'm no doctor, but you know, I know there's a lot of studies on the different <clears throat> benefits that it could have, but shouldn't this gentleman have the option with their doctor? Well, and you know, if, if you could have cannabis prescribed, maybe it wouldn't, or maybe it would be the, the one thing that really did help, or maybe working synergistically with some of the other things that would be the key to just a little bit less pain. It would be easy enough to get marijuana, but I'm drugs every time I go mm -hmm. Right. The only Opioids are hit between liquid morphine and my phone. And I do have a bubble machine that every six hours I can give myself a quarter of those more pain than one marrow. But it does nothing for the nerve. Uh, a couple more things. Sure. Um, some of those studies, they don't just um, report the outcomes in pain reduction, say from an eight to a six or an eight to four, they also do questionnaires regarding function and improvement in quality of life, improving the function, which to a lot of folks, and I'm sure he'd agree, is, is every bit as important as reduction in a pain score, right? 
uh, and those were in line with the pain reduction scores. They did improve function. They did improve quality of life, which as a physician, you know, that's what we strive to do. Uh, and it's a tool I think that can help with that in certain conditions. One other thing, just to clarify, when I was talking about safety earlier, it's not just the easy button. There are certain populations that you don't prescribe it in. Someone with an uh, unstable or uncontrolled psychiatric condition, the, those conditions can be worsened by cannabis use. Um, certainly there's, uh, you don't want to give it to young folks or pregnant folks because we don't have data on that. The brain's not fully developed. You know, we think until age 21, so maybe a little later. Uh, so we don't want to give, um, you know, cannabis there until we completely understand what the long-term effects are in a developing brain. So like I said, not an easy button, but safe when prescribed responsibly. And on top of that, I will say there are many drug interactions with cannabis that um, a lot of pharmacists are not trained on because cannabis is a C1 drug. And so typically the pharmacy um, education environment has been hands off. It's C1, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, that has been a disservice to pharmacists and to patients in my mind. So um, the more I learned about cannabis, the more I became passionate about educating patients and asking patients if they use cannabis, because we need to make sure that patients are comfortable telling healthcare professionals about use of cannabis. Uh, if you are not comfortable as a patient telling your, your, your physician, your healthcare professionals, your pharmacist, um, they're not going to know about drug interactions that could be happening. There are serious drug interactions that we need to know about. And that's part of the safety that we need to address as well, not just the safety of, it, of use of cannabis, but use of it with other medications. My name's Todd Hambleton. I'm from Pike County. I wasn't going to talk because I'm going to be talking from people very often. Um, and some of this is, is going to be more along the lines of things that you all need to consider to, in order to get something like this passed. So it's not that I'm against. Um, as far as the studies go, what he said, he ended up saying at the end here, um, kind of what I was going to say, which is there's probably a lot of pediatric use for this, right? Um, uh, intractable seizures, uh, I think in some of the behavioral categories that it, there's some, some benefit. People have anecdotally, they've shown benefit. The problem is you're not going to get physicians in general, definitely on the, the, the kids side of thing, but even some of the adults are not going to be like him. So he can go to his doctor and say he wants it. But until you get recognized studies out, doesn't matter that it's they, it, relatively safe. They're going to be either they're scared from a litigious standpoint or just not knowing the efficacy of that stuff. And, and, and so for using that, you're not going to get physician buy-in. So even if it's available in the state, there's gonna be a large portion of your population who's not gonna really get access to it because the physicians are not gonna recommend it. Um, so that's, that's part of why you have to have those studies. It's not just because it's gotta be proven safe or effective for whatever conditions. It, the, I think a lot of the studies need to be done in the kids. And again, those are funded normally by either pharma, which is not gonna do it in this particular case, or by the government. So one of the things you could do is work on the state to see if there's money to set aside to study some of this, maybe in conjunction with say, I know somebody's from Cincinnati on your all's call, but like Cincinnati Children's. Um, I know that there are people from this area who have kids with intractable seizures that go up there to, um, and they've recommended it, but again, they live in this area. So it's not something that's easily obtainable. Um, when you talk about the use in a lot of people, you're talking about the use for, for people that have already tried to go through all of these other steps, right? And so um, it, at some point, the, what little benefit, you have to look at the risk versus benefit ratio and it may not help them. Like what you were saying to this gentleman earlier, which was, well, maybe it'll help you, maybe it won't. Is the risk worth trying to see if it'll help? We've tried everything else. So why don't you give it a try? I mean, there are some benefit to coming through with those kind of things. There's a lot of stuff that, that would need to get taken care of. Um, as a physician, if we're talking about recommending it, um, in some ways, I think home grow is, is going to be a good thing. My only question is going to be, how do you know what you're growing compared to, he, he mentioned um, quality. 
And, but I know that there's differences in types, like what she mentioned, right? So sometimes you may get a high from one kind versus a low from another kind, whatever. And so I don't know what the process is that you're all going to consider to kind of figure out the efficacy of that. But I think if it would be better served for the community, if it included people like the advocates and pharmacists, um, and it wasn't strictly a law enforcement type of thing, whether it's sending in, you, you do your home grow when you send in a thing every three months to get tested to make sure that it's meeting a certain level of whatever, um, as opposed to, um, and that can be have some oversight with people that are outside of the normal governmental or the law enforcement range that would um, kind of have a, a I guess, skin in the game for that kind of thing. But those are, those are all things you're gonna have to consider. For kids, we won't prescribe it for any kind of kid until we know, because the dosing is so different. So you can, it's with an adult, doesn't matter that much, right? You, you grow what you grow, you give it to them. It's maybe a little more, maybe it's a little less. When you're talking about kids, they're so small and it's all based, the dosing is based on weight. So how much they get depends on what's going on, you know, how much they are. Okay. Well, I didn't, I don't know. I, some of this is just thoughts. I didn't have prepared stuff. Those are all things that I, I can yeah. see that people are going to ask questions about. Um, I, I really think that the push needs to be there, especially get some of the money for the research, because this definitely has, like, I, I mean, I, I, I can tell you that there are people that have seen benefit in their kids with seizures, people that have seen benefit in the behavioral stuff. And, and, Truthfully, there's all the newest studies that are coming out. There's a new one that um, we just talked about with a talk with UK recently that was looking at specifically looking at sedation for uh, long term in babies. And one of the things they found was that pretty much everything that we use for sedation can have some kind of developmental delay issue later on. Um, I think there was maybe one medicine that didn't in the end. And so we know that all of the stuff that we use can have problems in kids. And there are some long-term complications. So even assuming that there's some risk with cannabis, it's it's not there's risk with everything that we're using. And so we need to explore the use of that in other ways that may benefit us. Maybe it doesn't cause developmental delays. Maybe there's a break point in, in the dosing or how long they're dosed that would um, not would, would maybe cause problems. And under that, it doesn't. But until we get studies to see how that works, it's hard for us to use it in those ways. And nobody's going to, I mean, none of the physicians are going to do that um, from that perspective. But that stuff needs to get looked at because, again, I think the benefit, there's really a potential benefit there. And as far as it being a scheduled medication, I mean, we give kids amphetamines all the time for treatment of ADHD, right? So, um, there, there is always the potential for anything from that standpoint, but you, first you show there's no risk. And I think the risk profile is relatively low. And then from there, you need to be able to show how much you need to give for benefit, at least from our side of things. I, I'm a, I do kids, babies. So, um, you know, the adult side of things, I leave to Dr. Hatton. <laughs> Thank you. He, he does bring up some really good points. I think, um, I don't recall the name of the exact syndrome and Dr. Hamilton would probably know it, but um, if you think the data is scarce for adults, then for babies, it's non-existent. You know, when I looked, uh, I think there were two studies and I think it involved a total of about four, four kids. And I forget the name of the syndrome, but it was this intractable seizures like he's talking about. And some of them were having 30 to 60 seizures per day. And that is completely handicapped. And you can imagine the impact that has on the families. And uh, some of them were reduced to like three right. nocturnal seizures. But again, that's four patients. There's no way that you could recommend that based on that lack of data. And I think we're a long way from that. But it's like you said, scheduling, if we could get some, uh, if we could get it at least taken down to where we can do some research on that kind of stuff because you got to imagine that's if that were to be if that were to hold true and you could have that big of an impact on seizure reduction in babies mm -hmm. that's a game changer may i interject can you hear me
some of them are happy symptoms that are not obvious, so they come from subclinical depression, but it's not expensive to treat them. But they are, to put a, a neat point on it, they are definitely seen. And so, so and helping those kids have some kind of quality of life and be able to do it, um, I think there's a lot of benefit there. The problem is that you have to get somebody like a Cincinnati to prescribe it, and they've gone through all of these other options. But again, a lot of the medications that they're giving have other side effects, and there's significant side effects for some of these things. The liver function is not so good. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of benefit there. It's just it's, it's got to be more kind of creative for us to look at it and see beyond anecdotal evidence and case reports where you look at three or four kids and say, well, this happened. We know it happened. We just don't know the best way to use it. Children with intractable epilepsy is my specialty. I am mom to one with Dravet syndrome. She, um, it's a rare and deadly form of epilepsy resistant to most um, any, any drugs. Um, there was no prognosis when we got started. She started in a clinical trial in 2016 and it has saved her life. Prior to that, I, we have never had a doctor who has not recommended cannabis to us. She's seen, um, I'd say, half of every ep uh, pediatric epileptologist in this state, every therapist. Um, the, the pharmaceutical drugs that she was on were destroying her liver, her teeth, her bones, her, um, her kidneys, just destroying um, we, we worry too much about, um, we talk about, oh, well, this isn't safe and that isn't safe. Well, what is safe? Because at this point, you know, it, it became a point where my child is dying and you want to worry that, um, that something's not safe for her. Like, what do we have to lose? And it, and it got to that point. And I had her doctors tell me straight up, go find it go get it. You have nothing to lose, everything to gain. And I wouldn't do it. I was scared that, you know, oh, well, she'll have a seizure. We'll have to go to the emergency room. She'll test positive for this. I'll be on the news. They'll take her from me. And, and I wouldn't do it. Um, but finally, in 2016, everything changed. Um, her life has changed. She's, she's a different child. We were able to cut out all of those harmful pharmaceuticals um, and by half or more. And it, it's changed everything. It's, she, it saved her life. She got cognitive gains. And again, um, in talking to her physicians, I do believe the studies are there. They're in, from other countries. Maybe they're not up to our standards. Maybe um, we're not allowed to see those, but I believe, and especially in the field of neurology, pediatric epileptology and neurology, they're out there. And I don't know anybody who is not recommending these for both pediatric patients and adults. Um, I, I just feel like in the medical community, it's maybe taboo for you to talk to each other about this, but, but doctors are talking to their patients about it. And they're, we are grateful to, um, they're all on board. They're ready for this. And, and we are too. I'm very open about my daughter and her story. Um, but there are thousands of others just like her, just as desperate hiding. And, and, and so often it's aggravating to hear how, you know, we're so worried about the harmful, but she's been on Valium since she was four months old. She has no quality of life. I, you know, what, what do we have to lose? Well, and, and that's kind of what I meant when I was saying, again, you're talking about the difference between you did have to go through all of that first. And then everybody was saying, well, let's try this as opposed to, Oh, well, we've, we know that in kids with this problem, like they've studied it, it's, and, and it works more often with this drug. Sometimes I just, with that, right. as opposed to having to go through all of that process of all the other medications first. 
Sometimes I feel like doctors just need to ask themselves though, when they're, when they're talking to patients, um, rather than say, oh, we don't know if we can do this because it's safe or not. I question, well, who are you to tell somebody that they can't, a terminal patient, whether it's um, somebody on their deathbed dying of cancer, or it's a child with zero quality of life, who are you to worry about their safety and, and, and what's going to happen? Why can't we, um, sometimes you just have to realize that it, things are worth the risk and we jumped and, and I'm so glad we did. Things are different now. I'm here today and not in a hospital room with her. And, um, we've been able to travel. We just got back from a wonderful trip to Montana. It was great. Um, but she's a different child now. And without cannabis in her life, there would be, there was no prognosis before. And uh, we have hope now. And sometimes that's all people need. And, and we've got to remember too, that anything in our medicine cabinet, anything we eat, the air we breathe, it all comes with risks. It's all contaminated. This is a plant we're talking about. And when people, um, if people want to grow this at home, I have no problem with that. There are a million different strains and they all do different things, but um, I, can't, I can't think of anybody better to uh, grow my medicine but me. I know what works for me and she might need something that works different for her. So who are we to, who are we to stand in people's way? And I just wish that we would ask that question more of our physicians. But I really hope that people will start talking to their doctors more. Anybody who wants this, we need to have these conversations. So I greatly appreciate you bringing it up and, and we need more of this. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead real quick and let's let this time. Okay, I just want to say that... Um, my son also has epilepsy and um, for 16 years, we tried every drug you can think of and nothing would stop the seizures. And he was um, at his worst having around 200 petite mal seizures a day. I mean, it was just constant all day long. And um, so he was finally, we took him to the Mayo Clinic and he was diagnosed as drug resistant epileptic. And um, he, we have let him try medical cannabis from out of state, and he's now been 32 months, no seizures. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a pretty good testimony right there that that has, that has changed his life. And I'm, I'm very thankful that myself could share that. But. Thank you. Sir, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, my name is John Taylor, and I'm from Jefferson County. And I wanna thank everybody for coming and having this conversation. Uh, that's what a democracy is about. We have dialogue, we have back and forth. We hear oppositions, we hear law enforcement, we hear medical input, but this is an issue that I call more of a, a human rights issue. And the part of the constitution that says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there's the part about we have a right to be healthy. I myself found uh, medical cannabis after I began having grand mal seizures in 2007, and they got worse. I listened to the doctors, I took phenobarbital and dilantin and lamictal. And I was told that my liver would uh, be deteriorated in 10 years and I'd be a candidate for a transplant. Um, that's about all we had to do in the cocktail. And I followed all the instructions. I kept having seizures. A couple of them were almost fatal. And after um, a near fatal event, uh, I took my health into my own hands and found a solution in Oregon. And I was referred to that by the parents of epileptic children that said, there's this stuff called low THC marijuana that has this compound called CBD. And that's really where it began for me. Uh, the moment that I started taking those compounds, uh, I went asymptomatic for almost five years. I went from seizing every two or three weeks. Um, to I've had, I think, six events in 11 years. I'm currently on a 10-month stretch because I quit taking my CBD oil last year and broke my back after I had a seizure in the shower. Uh, I don't know why it works. I'm not a doctor, but I'm an entrepreneur, an inventor, a mechanic, and now a chemist because i uh, I run one of the largest processing facilities in Kentucky called Commonwealth Extracts. We've seen the data. We've seen the pharmacology and the toxicology reports. I've worked with some of the largest ingredient suppliers, medical ingredient, cosmetic ingredient suppliers in the world. These compounds are not harmful. That's all there is to it. 
The problem, I think, has to do with more of a political and lobbying effort with the FDA because Cytovex is a drug that's FDA approved, and I believe families are billed somewhere around $36,000 a year. I can make the same tincture for $1,800 and make profit annually. So that's one issue, it's the vitamin drug issue. The other thing that I want to reiterate for the governor to review is that we have a contradiction in law. Schedule one narcotics are clearly listed as having no medical value. They're schedule one because there's a high risk of public abuse, misuse, um, other things that are very real concerns um, could be fatal. You could kill yourself on schedule one drugs. Nobody can explain to me in government that I've ever talked to in eight years of running this business why the Department of Health and Human Services owns a patent number 6630507 for all the nerds in the room. It's 29 pages talking about how it acts as an antioxidant and a neuroprotectant. It talks how it acts as an antagonist against MDNA receptors. It helps heal isemic insult and injury. It also helps with neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. This is not new information. You don't have to look very far. That patent was issued in 2004. So if we have a patent, how can there be no medical value? We're, we're caught up in a stalemate. And I think it's dialogue like this. It's very helpful. It's one of the most encouraging things that I get to do. We hear thousands of stories in my company. We have people calling from all over the world, really, asking for relief. Kentucky was one of the first that allowed CBD production, but it's limited because of THC and some unknowns. Um, the question that I would have for people is why do we want to allow people to continue to suffer? Anybody that wants marijuana currently has it. It's available in every county, in every town, anywhere. Those that have money can fly to Denver nonstop from Louisville. And in two hours, you're at a dispensary. There is no barrier to entry for anybody. It just hurts people without means. Poor people, please, if you have one more consideration in any bill, in any language, please do not tax this. Because the people who truly need it, the people who would benefit from a home grow operation, they're of limited means. And so making something unaffordable or pricing it above the black market will only continue to perpetuate the same. So again, I thank you all for your time. I'm not gonna go on. I just wanna kind of make my two cents. It does work as long as you take it. So again, thank you everybody and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. I, I definitely want to respond to him. Sure. One, he is my husband. So I can attest <laughs> to um, the things that has happened to him. Um, because of his seizures, he has, I have suffered from PTSD. If you have never, right? Have you, if you have never seen someone you love and care about have a grand mal seizure, I hope you never do. It is horrific. The first time I ever saw that, it just, it, it still tears me up. I can't even watch a movie when someone has a seizure because it just, it just makes me a nervous wreck. Of course, we forgot our CBD today too. So girls, you might have to hook me up. Um, but to, to talk, when John had that horrible fatal uh, could have been a uh, seizure. And we went to his neurologist and all they wanted to do was increase his pills. He was actually up to 28 pills a day. Not only did they say he'd need a new liver, but that he'd be in a wheelchair, that he would have a drool rag and that he would not have a quality of life just because of the medications. So that, that really is when we were like, that's it. We have got to try something different. And cannabis truly, truly did save his life. And not even him with the seizures, but I lost a niece to a heroin overdose. I know, I know that had she not been prescribed the opiates and become addicted to them and then them taken away from her, she wouldn't have reached out for heroin. She wasn't that type of person. The next thing you know, she's 29 years old with two little girls that she left for, for my sister to raise. So it is extremely important that we think about all of the all of this for everyone because the opiate addiction here in Kentucky is insane. I own a CBD store. Obviously, my husband and I are kind of in the same realm of business, but every day I have people coming in my store telling me that it's helping them with withdrawal symptoms. I'm like, yay, keep it up. Keep taking it every day. And granted, it's just the CBD. So the THC levels are not high. People are not getting high off the, T the CBD products, but it still gives some little bit of relief. People need more THC. I've always agreed with that. 
there should not truly be a limit, but at least we do have this. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm so thankful that John's here today because I don't know that he would have been had he still be taking those pills. I really don't. So thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. My name is Susie Ellison. I'm a retired high school math teacher from Johnson County, just up the road here. And about 25 years ago, my mother was dying from Alzheimer's disease. And I was working on my master's and I was fortunate to have access to a lot of databases when you're in the academic realm and stuff. And so my professor would allow me to research cannabis for Alzheimer's, THC, what's it doing? So I did all that and I was convinced my mother's been gone for 20 years now. And I, nothing will convince me otherwise because 25 years ago, I was reading those studies that are from uh, Israel and other places around the world that THC will combat those plaques that are forming in the brains, okay? I've not been tested. I'm not going to be tested. I chose not to be tested. I might have the same markers that my mother had, but I've outlived her diagnosis and uh, maybe got a couple more years. She, she was comatose for about four years before she passed. So I still, I'm walking, I'm talking, I'm traveling, I'm advocating. THC is necessary for all, Alzheimer's disease. Now I may be wrong, you guys are the professionals. CBD is gut related, correct me if I'm wrong. But if you're gonna break that brain barrier, you gotta have THC. Did I say it right? CBD for the gut, primarily. Well, I'm getting there. But you got to have THC to get to that Alzheimer's level. Okay? I'm not a specialist in what you guys are. I just know what I've read and what I've studied. Okay? So you can't convince me otherwise. THC for Alzheimer's. I'm all about it. In 2013, uh, my last few years teaching, my children had all graduated. I suffered a cardiac failure and it was because of the cocktail of pills that I was on, antidepression. I buried my grandparents, my parents, uh, my sister, uh, eight students overdosing in a short period of time. And this is high school kids, so there was a lot going on, but I had pills to keep me from peeing on myself, blood pressure, high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, antidepressant, this pill, I mean, a cocktail of pills, okay? A teacher, throw them in my mouth and go and do my job, what I had to do. 2013, I came home from an international academic competition and basically collapsed. I had an exit fraction of 18. I don't know if some of you all know what that means. That's practically dead. Okay, so the pills, no pills, no more pills, okay? These were legal pills. These weren't opiates. These were just pills and stress and a lot of other factors. Well, that was the same year that we were allowed to start using CBD. So immediately I was on CBD. I'm, like, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna start using it. But other than the CBD, I'm illegally healed. Eight years ago, I was dead. But last fall, I got a cardio workup in Lexington and I have a really good heart, okay? Yeah, I did lose the stress in the classroom. Yeah, I lost all those pills. And yeah, I found cannabis. But now here's what the problem is. How much fentanyl is coming across our border? Where's my next medication going to come from? Where's your next medication going to come from? Who knows? Who knows? I just traveled 60 days. I've been in all 37 states of them uh, that are legalized. I've purchased legally in every state I've been in. Wide range of variety. There are those packages you can't get in. There are those packages that'll flip right up. Now I'm all about safety and security. Mm -hmm. So we need to do that. But what we need to do first is go out in our flower beds. And what kind of tomatoes are you growing this year? Are you growing Romas, Tommy Toes? Are you in the heirloom strain? I wanna grow my medicine. I've seen it grown. I've watched it grow. I know that I could grow it in Maine. Let me grow for five people. This is what we need to do, folks. Governor, what's stopping it? Greed, race, money, and a few other organizations. It's political. 
the fact that it's illegal is racist. My heart's beating really fast. I didn't bring my CBD either. Mm -hmm. But I did see my doctor before I went on this trip. I, I said, doc, I said, this and this and, and this. I said, I ran out of CBD about three months ago and I haven't gotten any more of it. And I need to, he said, well, yeah, you need to get back on your CBD. So this doctor followed me from cardiac failure in 2013, all the way through. You're my doctor. If you're my doctor, this is what I'm going to do. He's documenting it. He's on board. He's ready. Pass the law. I'm not talking to you all. I'm talking like to the governor, to everybody else, whoever's seeing this. It's time. It's overdue. I am legally healed, illegally healed. Thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. Ma'am. Susie. Call that number on your wristband. Oh, I do. Yes, make sure you're calling, especially okay. come January. Yeah, call. Speed yes. Speed Please do. Um, as far as I know, my local legislators are all yeses, uh, even the new people. I know medical people. I know many people in this area that are supporting. They are supporting. The nose yes. too. Pardon me? Call the nose too. Yeah, yes, yes. It don't yes. matter. Our, our legislators um, from all over Kentucky work together to pass our laws. So whether or not they're yours or, or they're from across the, the I, state, you can call them too. What the, a lot of people don't, don't realize is when they make that telephone call and they say, who would you like to have this message sent to? Every one of them. Yep. All of them. Every single one of them send this message. Yeah, I do. you can do that. And we appreciate it. And thank you so much thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Or is it based on her personal county? It's the legislative hotline and you just call. It's very easy. The people there are very nice. Uh, it's a message board and you would call and leave. It's 1-800-372-7181. And you just leave a number for your legislators. Right, Angie, and she gets them. So. Okay, um, that was, I guess, that answers my follow-up question too. Was there a way on the website the um, that you guys have to post like your local legislative for all the counties? Because I don't know how to get it. I tried. Come Googling. see me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yes. My name is uh, Randall DeWitt. I'm from Nelson County. I'm 24. And uh, currently I'm working in the R&D lab at a hemp company based in uh, Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, and kind of corroborating what Mr. Taylor here was saying, uh, there are companies that are ready to make the right decision with third party testing and studies that they themselves might be conducting. Um, and they're ready to create good, high quality product for Kentuckians. And really what we're talking about whenever we're talking about, um, you know, medical cannabis is we're really talking about Delta 9 THC, you know, CBD, we're working with that currently, but opening up legislation for Delta 9 THC opens up a, a litany of other uh, tools that physicians will have in order to treat their patients. Um, and I just really want to stress that there are companies out there who are already making products that are kind of shackled by really an archaic system um, of, of laws that have been put forth by the war on drugs. And if you, if you open this up, there are people ready to put good, fast-acting medicine into the hands of the people in their community. So I'd just like you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Sorry, that's one other thing I wanted to add. Um, the importance of legalization is not only um, just for um, Kentucky patients. You know, we worry about um, on the black market right now, people, if you get marijuana, it's been passed down through many hands. You don't know what's in it, where it came from. We've got fentanyl killing everybody right now. You don't know if something's laced with that, at least um, in um, 
with legalization, we have seed to store regulations in place, or it, or it comes from your own yard. It's what, you know, a lot of people are hoping at least doing it that way people can be sure that they're getting a safe, clean product. And that's not always the case right now. I think in order to be past legalization, we gotta let go of some of the government bureaucracy um, who's running um, certain programs right now in the state. I do, I am a little bit fearful of that. I think, Licensing would be, um, it should be affordable. I realize that there should be limits on that, but if dispensary owners, it should not be so far out of reach and so expensive to become a license holder. Um, I think that is super important. I also think we need to keep it to Kentuckians and not let people from out of state coming in and fueling the market because they will eventually have REC if that's what they want. So I think it's super important to realize that in order to keep it medical, not necessarily, I mean, REC will be here eventually, like it is, will, and I think federally eventually, but in order to keep it medical, it needs to be real Kentuckians doing it, not just people from out of state purchasing all those licenses. That's kind of what has happened in the past. Thank you. Would uh, anybody else? Can you no. hear? Okay. Well, I think this was a <clears throat> a very helpful first town hall meeting. This is what we wanted. We wanted to hear from Kentuckians. And uh, I think we've got a lot of compelling yeah. stories here. Yeah. And uh, like I say, uh, I really want to express the committee's gratitude for your participation tonight. Well, and, and thanks again for coming out and sharing. Uh, all the comments from tonight's meeting will be shared with the governor. I can assure you that. Well, you Another big thank you to uh, Representative Hatton uh, from, and also Pikeville University for making this possible. I just want to remind everybody that there are three more town hall meetings scheduled um, in in northern and northern part of the state and then the western part of the state and in Frankfurt and you can gather more information on that at, at medicalcannabis.ky.gov. So with that I think we'll end the meeting and thank you and have a, a, a safe travels home. We appreciate everybody. Thank you. Leave it. Thanks it out. Leave the meeting. <laughs>